Hi everyone, I'm uh, Peter Desmet and I want to talk about how we developed a data exchange format, lessons learned from CampFrabDP. Um, also, really would like to talk to uh, Jacob Bipnicki, who's the other co-maintainer of CampFrabDP. So what is CampFrabDP? CampFrabDP stands for uh, Camera Trap Data Package. Uh, it's both a model and a format to exchange camera trap data. And it's really designed to capture all the essential data and metadata of a camera trap study. But in this talk, I'm not really going to talk about what is CamTrapDP, but more about how we developed CamTrapDP. There's a link to a talk I gave at the TEDWIC meeting in 2021. And there's also a paper coming out that already has a preprint that describes all the aspects of CamTrapDP. So why did we develop CamTrapDP? Just like biologging data, camera data is really taking off with massive amounts of data being collected. Um, and the good thing is that a number of data management systems have sprung up, like a good deep trapper and wildlife insights that really help researchers and manage their data. So it's not really necessary to do all that data management yourself on your computer. And those systems also really help you annotate all the information because, yeah, it's great to have a whole bunch of images or videos of your animals, but you also need to also annotate all of that and know what is in there and a number of AI systems have sprung up that can really um, facilitate this process. Unfortunately, those data management systems still work a lot like silos. So people interact with the systems, get data out of the systems, but there's like communities developing around those systems that don't really interact with each other because the way that the data is exported from those systems don't really are not really interoperable. Um, so that hinders harmonization and also we've seen little data publications from those systems. We also looked at certain standards to be able to share that information. There is, of course, Darwin Core. There was a previous attempt, the CTMS, the Camera Trap Data Manage uh, the Metadata Standard, but those haven't really taken off or are within the community not really comfortable or recognizable as a format that they want their data to be exchanged in. So that's why we developed CamTrap DP and we used two guiding principles. One, it must really allow easy and interoperable data exchange. And from the start, we really want to develop this in an open, collaborative way. So we try to go for a simple data model that consists of three tables. You have deployments, you have media that are collected during those deployments, and then you have a lot of observations derived from those, uh, from those media. This was really hard to do, to really find a simple data model that supports a lot of use cases, and we believe it supports many deployment methods, many ways of classifying the images, many ways also to support analytical use cases. And I've had dreams about this data model and trying to kind of figure out like what would be one that we can communicate easily that is not too complicated, but that can still um, cover all those use cases. Um, the other thing we did is uh, we built on frictionless standards, which are open generic specifications um, that can really help to describe data sets, uh, file formats, and tabular data. So we don't reinvent the wheel there. And the nice thing is they are simple, uh, machine readable, and extendable. So what we have is a system, a CamTrap DP is also a frictionless data package, meaning that we can use all the software out there to validate and read camera trap data or a CamTrap DP file and we don't have to reinvent all those things that are already there. Um, to give an example, uh, on the right you see how we defined a table schema or a field in or a table in, in Camtra BP. And all the blue elements are coming from frictionless. So those are terms like the name of a field, a description, whether a field is required or unique. All of those properties can be defined in frictionless. And then we also link out to existing standards like Darwin Core or the Visual Core. And the way we do that is we have field names that make sense for us in CamTrap DP, but we link out to those standards, basically saying this is the same thing as that definition over there. And our definition might be exactly the same. So like in the third example, you see our capture method is the same as the resource creation technique as defined in Audiovisual Core. Uh, it's an exact match, um, but what we have as a deployment ID, there's a broader concept out there, which is the parent event ID in Darwin Core. So that is how we try to map CamTrapDP to other standards, 
which then really helps people to also map to those other standards or kind of say, oh, that's what you mean with that term in CamTrapDB. Um, that also allows us to have CamTrapDB really be domain specific, but also be highly interoperable with other standards that are already out there. Also for the metadata, we linked out to uh, existing standards like the uh, data site metadata schema. Um, we developed everything in CamTrapDP from the start open on GitHub. This is something and I'm so happy that Tedwick has really adopted um, to redevelop standards in the open. And we did, of course, the same with CamTrapDP. Um, it's licensed under an MIT license, meaning you can use whatever part of the standard. We just don't make any assertions that is going to work for you. Um, and we also version every change in the standard. Uh, and we also use semantic versions for like the big uh, stable releases. So we've been working to release 1.0. Um, and we use also to collaborate on this, we have issues on GitHub. So as you might see, there's currently 234 closed issues up to this uh, 1.0 release. We're almost there. New ones get added that we're thinking, ah, oh, yeah, we really would like to have this for the 1.0 release. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. And then we discuss those online, uh, review those um, encoding sprints and then implement uh, through pull requests. And we also have automated tests to make sure that we don't break anything. Um, one of the things we have in the repository is an example data set that moves with the standard. And we try to make sure that it's always in sync with the changes in the standard. And finally, GitHub also has this cool feature, GitHub pages. So we have all the documentation up there. And there's a website that is built automatically from the standard. Um, and this example data set that I mentioned. And this uh, website is, is really useful for people who don't want to dive into your repository and see the technical information, just have a human readable page to kind of figure out what it is. The other thing we try to do is reach out to software developers in the camera trap community who are maintaining those data management systems like Trapper or Guti or uh, systems to analyze uh, the data. And uh, also, we've been lucky to collaborate with GBIF to get CamTrapDP as a publication format in the GBIF IPT. Um, it's been very challenging to coordinate to, and on the one hand, have a developing or a standard that is still in beta and like develop this, and also immediately implement this in the software out there. But it's been really rewarding because people can get their hands on the thing and give you feedback. Um, but it does mean if People come to me with say, hey, I would like to have this new field in the standard. I have to think, okay, does this make sense? Are there enough use cases? And how is this going to trickle down to all the software that needs to be updated? So we really hope to, when we have uh, the 1.0 release, uh, to have something a bit more stable. Um, embracing participation, having a short sticky name like CamTrapDP really allows to communicate um, and we reached out to people that are not really interested in standards too. Um, so yeah, through conferences and we have a GP webinar. Um, we wrote a paper on the standard and invited a lot of co-authors from the camera trap community to kind of see, does this make sense to you? And got a lot of feedback that way. Um, we were also happy, uh, lucky to have, uh, to be able to write a best practice for managing and publish camera trap data. And the feedback that we've gotten there uh, also improved. CamTrapDP. So it is collecting a lot of use cases. And every time somebody walks up to me and has a new use case, I'm getting a little bit excited and scared. Like, is it going to hold? And so far, it holds. So I'm really happy. Um, but yeah, you have to give it time. It's now been three and a half years since we first started um, to really build trust that this is going to be something that uh, people can actually use. And then you also have to think about the future, uh, think about maintenance. So both on the technical side, it is version. So data sets will always point to a specific version of the standard. Uh, so you know, like it was a correct data set uh, according to this version. And we'll have software that can upconvert the data set if needed. So it becomes even more interoperable across versions as well. And then on the people side, yeah, you need to have committed maintainers. And we hope by uh, having it under the umbrella of Tadwick that we can also have the support and maintainers. And, Basically, making people interested in this standard is the best way to get people also contribute to the standard. 
And funding is an important aspect too, and we did manage to secure funding for the future of CAMTRA-BFD, at least for the next three years. So those were the lessons we learned throughout developing CAMTRA-BP, uh, using a simple model, uh, picking up what's already out there, don't reinvent the wheel, really develop openly, aggressively, um, and yeah, embrace participation. So if people come up with a use case, they're actually super happy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, can we see if there's questions online first? Nothing. Doug Osler again. I want to follow up similar as the question to Holger. Uh, would CAMTRAP DP facilitate live streaming data? And just highlight again that we are very interested in live streaming data for the digital twins. So you're coming up to me with an interesting use case, and I'll have to think about that. But uh, yeah, I'll have to see. I don't have an immediate answer to that. Uh, thanks, Peter. That was a good talk. Um, I'm curious if you were going to do this again, develop another standard. Uh, <laughs> What sort of estimate would you give yourself for the number of people that you need and the uh, length of time that you need? I have locked my time for the last two years, so I can give you numbers on that. But yeah, it's um, yeah, we, with Jacob and me, this has probably been like three months over the last three years. So like a quarter person that you really like invest in the, not only developing the standard, but also reaching out, maintaining the software. I'm also like a co-maintainer of software out there, reviewing pull requests. So yeah, it's, uh, I would say like half a person per year for now the last three years, more or less to like be really serious about it. Thanks, I guess I'm next. Thank you very much for great piece of work. Uh, we discussed this a little bit one-to-one. -one. I just want to repeat uh, the key point from that discussion. I think it's great to start and to form the standard that captures this kind of data type, testing the cameras which are designed and, and used by people capturing mostly mammals and, and birds. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess the general trend in biodiversity data generation is to praise monitoring to reduce the lag between observation and digital and digital availability of the data. So it sort of connects to Doug's question about live or near live streaming. And I think the, the, the taxonomic focus will be shifting from vertebrates, which is like all cool, but this is Hakuna Matata biodiversity. This is the planet of insects. So I think the, the really, really interesting uh, direction for developing is further is to see how much this standard will capture the insect capturing camera traps, the light traps, the traps uh, capturing fungivorous insects and all these uh, things which are developed now, for instance, in the context of the Mambo project. Yeah. So um, I hope the work doesn't stop here. And I don't know what are your plans? How do you want to develop it further? Is it kind of now you close the shop or? No, I mean, we're really trying to get to this 1.0 release. And I have the slides from my presentation in Tedwick 2021. Yeah, we're almost there. But now I believe we are really almost there. Um, but um, I think for the insect cameras, I think that is within scope it's, if it's a stable camera. And I'm also thinking for the live stream. I mean, this is both a format and a model. You don't have to necessarily adopt the format, but the model in which the data is, is structured, I think is going to work for live streams, insect cameras, uh, as, as live streams or as static data sets. Um, yeah, I think it's flexible enough. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm not an expert on camera straps, but I, I like the way that you've, you've set up the work uh, in, in the open. How do you think, obviously you've set up that project that way from the start. How could we retrofit that way of working to, to other tablet standards? Well, I think it, um, you can always start. I mean, the, the, I, I think one very important aspect is that the, this the documents that you really consider part of the standard, that those are versions. There's a lot of things fluttering around there that we also captured in GitHub. I think the, the start would be for these other standards that to at least have 
what is sometimes called the normative documents or like the technical things to really have those on GitHub. And then you bring in the other discussions more into GitHub. But yeah, sometimes some people do not want to interact with GitHub. I mean, researchers we work with, they only commented on the paper. They never looked at the GitHub repository. So you're always going to have that. Okay, thanks very much, Peter. Uh, for the last uh, contributor talk of the conference, we've got Peter Huibres, also from IMBO. Uh, the title of his talk is Big Data for Beginners. 